again to another episode of the pod i am darren and here also with me vanessa hello how are you darren i'm doing all right how are you i'm i'm good happy belated birthday thank you i mean that just happened as of recording time so here we are I know. Have you been watching anything uh, or reading anything good these days? I, you know, we haven't talked about this in so long because, you know, we've cut back, like, and stop recording the referral slips kind of with quarantine because scheduling has gotten a little crazy. And so, you know, I like to check in every once in a while. Um, yeah, uh, I imagine you've got more, so I'll go first. <laughs> and I I have been going back over the comics, just in case. Uh, it, just in case you decided to read any of it. And I also... Not, nothing really new, new. Revisiting some stuff. I've been checking out but trying not to go too far in uh, a book about Charles Manson and the CIA that you talked about Ooh. The, Ooh. that chaos book yay because um, it's you know it's, it's there so it's easy to pick up and poke around in. So that's not really a whole lot of reading or audio books. Uh, As I told you previously, I just got current on American Horror Story. And I'm watching Wu-Tang and American Saga. And another comics-related thing, the long-awaited adaptation of Why the Last Man came out. How is that? I've I've seen commercials for it, and it sounds like it could be interesting. I mean, like it, it sounds like a possibly interesting premise. I'm liking it. I it's. I mean, I'm not familiar with the comic. Okay, so the basic premise is, and it's the same in the comic and in the book, but the book is now, and the comic was something like ten, fifteen years ago. Right. When it started, it started. A, there was somebody who was like, is it going to be like The Walking Dead? And that's that's when I double checked. And they came out within the comics came out within a yeah. couple years of each other. But yeah, mm-hmm. the basic premise is uh, there's this guy, Yorick. And he, he's training a monkey to be like a helper monkey, like in Monkey Shines or something like that. And all of a sudden, something happens, and every male animal on Earth dies. Yeah. Except for him and his male monkey. And so it's kind of a post-apocalyptic, or I don't know if the, a world of women would consider it too big well, of a catastrophe. <laughs> but, well, but, but no, it, actually, ecologically... Right. That is catastrophic. So, I mean... I mean, when you look at it from that pure biological, just healthy ecosystem point of view, that is catastrophic. Yes. Uh, as much of a pain in the ass as some men can be. And... <laughs> <laughs> so, it's... It, yeah, that's the basic setup uh, in the comic book. It sometimes it jumps around uh, in timelines, you know, for like comics do. Um, oh shit, Diane Lane. I don't want to get it wrong. I think it's Diane Lane plays Yorick's mom. Who I thought that was Diane Lane in the commercials. 
I've seen the commercials for it while watching um, two of my recommends. And um, I was like looking, I'm like, is that Diane Lane? But I haven't seen her lately. So, and also, you know, when they do those kinds of shows, they sometimes grunge people up, you know? Mm. So those kind of a, a post-apocalyptic things, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, uh, that is her. It is her. Okay. I like her a lot. So she, she plays his mom. And uh, she's a senator, and she's in the line of mm-hmm. succession. Uh, and it's just, I don't want to say a whole lot more than that, but it's kind of, yeah. I, I, I would compare it, at least at the beginning here, I think there's three episodes or four episodes. I've seen the first three. Yeah. Uh, it is similar to Walking Dead, where... It's a big catastrophe, a global catastrophe, and seeing how people react to it. Yeah. And, of course, there's the weirdness of he and his monkey are the only... uh, They they did update it where, uh, at one point, uh, there are, uh, you know, trans men. That did, okay. sur- that did survive, but it appears that he is he and uh, his monkey ampersand Yay. are the only people <laughs> with Y chromosomes that survived. So, I recommend we get it. A monkey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's got he's got his monkey, and Imogen Poots or Imogen like her. Poots is in it, and. Interesting characters, I would say, and mm-hmm. it's on FX or FXX or whatever the fuck it's called. I've got it on Hulu, but they can cuss and show. Yeah, you can violence. see it on Hulu. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can see it on Hulu. So there's good amount of blood and gore in the appropriate points, um, and yeah, they started out well, and. Uh, yeah, I, uh, that that is that is my recommend. That and the the comic, I also recommend. But I think that it might be cooler to see a more updated version, at least the way they've been doing it now, where they they adjust some things that seem were probably ignored even ten right. years ago. Um, right. But it was by a guy called. Old Brian K. Vaughn, who I may have recommended before, did a graphic novel called The Pride of Baghdad, which is a beautiful graphic novel. And it's mm-hmm. a story about animals that escaped from the Baghdad Zoo after America invaded right. the first or second time. But it's a story told through them. You know, the animals all talk and stuff but they all represent different people there's you know lions and i don't know about tigers but there's at least one bear uh so yeah i I would recommend the show and the comic right now but i've Mm -hmm. definitely had more of the comic uh but the show yeah just just came out and uh, yeah about three or four episodes in Okay. But they've been talking about it forever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I didn't think there were that many episodes. I didn't get that idea, but but I had seen ads like a while in advance, but it didn't seem like they had been putting episodes out until like actually recently. Yeah, first episode was on the 13th of September. Oh, okay. Probably just three episodes. Unless yeah. they did like two release the first day and then the next week they had just one episode, you know, like every week after they're only doing one episode. But sometimes I found that with FX, sometimes their original series, they'll put out the first two episodes of the season the same day. Yeah. And then every week after they'll just release one episode. Yep, they did. I mean, they did that with Handmaid's Tale. They did that with What We Do in the Shadows. And I think they did well, that with uh, Wu-Tang also. 
Well, Hulu is Handmaid's Tale. Right. They did that with, but I I'm mean, that's all FX, of these. I'm saying FX, though, does this oh, on their network. okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Because, it, yeah, and uh, just for, like, particularly with newer series, uh, to try to really get people pulled in, it's, like, just a, a newer kind of tactic. That they seem to be doing, yeah, and and because who they saw Hulu doing it, I think. Um, that's what seems to. I think Hulu started doing it first with their original series, but maybe I have that backwards. Uh, they're um, connected. It's hard to know where. The right, line is. right, exactly. Um, yeah. Well, that's cool. I think I will um, definitely check that out. Cool. Yeah, I, I hope you enjoy it. And how's the comic? I liked the comic a lot. I'm trying to think back to when I first started reading it. It, mm-hmm. it was drawn well. There's a lot of round characters. You know, sometimes when a dude does a comic that's largely of women, yeah. it can get problematic easy. Right. And I don't remember that really being an issue. I think there may have been a couple more a man, you know, uh, times in the comic than there have been so far in the show, but right. Well, also, if the comic was initially written ten whatever years ago, you know, and this is now just coming out, that you have more women in queer, you know non by and, and like trans non-binary people working behind the camera like getting on getting those opportunities now yes um than you did 10 years ago um so that could make a difference yeah i mean the showrunner i believe is a woman which probably helps that makes a big difference and i mean a lot of female names in the executive producers uh, well, we'll see. Well, there's Brian K. Vaughn, of course. You can't. Mm-hmm. Uh, Pia Guerrera, Melina Matsukis, Louise Friedberg, Mary Jo Winkler, Lofreda, Nina Jacobson, Brad Simpson, Eliza Clark, who was the developer of the show. Producers are yeah. Anna, Anna Babin and Nellie Reed. Cinematography by Kira Kelly and Catherine Lutz. Uh, yeah, I mean, looks like, like if women you're going, editors. <laughs> if you're going by the typical gender of most of those names, right? You, they are definitely female associated. I guess there's presumption in there, but the ones that For, have that's links, what I'm saying. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Uh, the names that have links, uh, Melina Matsukas is a, is a she won some video music awards and a medal from the AFI. Uh, her her original, her directorial debut was that Queen and Slim movie. Oh. She's one of the executive producers. Nina Jacobson, who worked on the Hunger Game series. Kira Kelly, one of the cinematographers best known for her work on 13th oh yeah yeah. and uh queen sugar yep Uh, and Catherine lutz canadian screen award best cinematography for disappearance at clifton hill so uh, yeah it looks that's that's, that sounds good i mean that gives me more hope than you know some other where you i mean if you have a comic like that that does seem so female focused, like with that many female characters. If you, I don't see how it would work if you didn't have a crew that had a significant amount of women. Yeah. Or, or like I said, or queer trans people and, you know, having some input. So yeah, there's almost 20 years between when the comic the comic started in 2002 oh. and went went to 2008 wow. 
Yeah. Wow. That wow. Well, that's that is a while. Things. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. A lot has changed. Yeah. And, um, so. Nice discussion since then. <laughs> yeah. Probably yeah. some stuff that I didn't pick up on last time I read it, but mm -hmm. it didn't have the same. Um, like we'll get to a little bit later after you do your stuff because I was the last of mine. But you know, it yeah. it it wasn't like cringy. Some other comics. Yes, yeah, it it wasn't cringy like some other comics that you might know. How about you? Well, you brought up. You already did mention briefly one thing I was going to say, but I will expand on it. You didn't know I was going to mention it, but we were talking about FX and Hulu. Um, I have been watching, I'm going to give you two, well, TV recommends that uh, are FX that I have been watching on Hulu. One is what we do in the shadows. Um, of course, the third season is out and the, they're only four episodes in, but in preparation for that, I rewatched season two and I forgot, like, I mean, season one was great, but it was like season two, just, there were some like real gem moments. And then season four, I don't, have you watched any of it so far? Season four? Yeah. No, season I... three. Oh, season three. Sorry. Uh, I saw the first episode. Well, I had already, like, leaned towards this line of thought, but now I've decided, Nadja, on there is my spirit. <laughs> she is great. Oh, my God. There was the moment... On, when I was watching the fourth episode and uh, granted I have been I've had a lot of days lately where I've been working a lot like gone through a lot of time working and I haven't been getting a lot of sleep so I'll sit back and I watch something and I'm just like a little slap happy but um I don't think I was that slap happy when I watched this and I had to she had been doing and saying things and singing things all through the episodes so far until this one moment. And finally I had to pause what I, the, you know, what I was watching until I could finish laughing. I was, just, <laughs> <laughs> it was just I, like, I, it made, I felt so much better. It was like, I really needed that. I haven't been watching a lot of movies lately because like I said, I have been working a lot lately and I just have felt like my brain can't handle something where I have to concentrate for an extensive amount of time. So if I do watch anything that's more than an hour, it's even like some, you know, it's a documentary that was made for TV that's even still at most an hour and a half, you know? Mm -hmm. And and it's something I'm not even fully watching uh, most of the time. Like, it's just, I just needed, but I needed more of these kind of little bits of comedy. And this is just, it continues to be so, like, well-written and produced. The cast is fantastic. What they do, what they start doing in season three, I I'm loving like some of what they're doing with with Guillermo. I, I was already kind of loving that last season, but it really now. Um, and what they the what they did with Nandor in I think it was episode three. The actual actor who plays Nandor. I'm not going to tell you all of it, but he is, he's British actor and he has to, in the episode, speak as if he is other people in the group. I've, so he I've heard to, about, I've heard about that. 
and I saw an entire interview that he did and to hear his accent and how it's so different, even than him doing Nandor. Um, but he's like, what I had to figure out, what I had to re realize was you have to not imitate, you know, all the actors that you know and that your coworkers, because their own accents are different than their characters. You have to imitate their characters and the accent that they do and or and even the mannerisms. And even if the accent's not perfect, the mannerisms are part of it. And it is fucking priceless. He just, it, it's, yeah. Yeah. It, it, you know, and I'm just like, it, they, they never cease to just like something about the show. Like they, they just get such good talent on there who are versatile in so many ways. And um, so, yeah, that's, con that's just continues to kind of keep getting better. And then have you watched, this is the first season for uh, Reservation Dogs. I still haven't started that because oh. Amanda Amanda wants to watch it with me. Well, and I got my mom into this now too. Um, but and I did not see this past week because my mom was out of town. She's not going to have access to it um, until she gets back from her trip. So I was going to wait. I think these are the one last week and the one tonight are like the last two episodes of the season so i was gonna wait to watch those till she was back from her trip so we could watch together but it's a half hour comedy as well but it tackles some actually like dramatic like socio-political issues and it's wonderful and another one this co-created by taiki uh watiti um but this one, you know, it's, you've got all indigenous people or almost entirely indigenous people behind the camera, but I believe they're all, um, the, you know, on camera talent are all indigenous as well. Um, even though it does center around four teenagers you know, live in a Lakota. Uh, it's, it, I don't think it's just a reservation. It's the land. It's like part reservation, but part, you know, the town that's right there, you know, um, mm -hmm. in Oklahoma. And they're using so much local talent, but um, I know in that instance of the four teenagers that it does center around, they're not, I don't, they're not all Lakota. I know uh, the girl in the group, she is Sue. I believe she's Sue. Um, but there is a trans or two-spirit character. Um, and they, and the, and even his friends, like, you know, will introduce themselves with their names and like give their pronoun. Um, nobody bats an eye. It's like, this is just normal life. Like, and I love that they've added that in where you just have a trans teenager because two spirit, you know, is under the umbrella term of trans. Um, you do have a trans teenager who they're, story isn't about them coming out and coming to terms with that identity. It's about them just being as a teenager. And this story actually focuses more on the part of their, you know, the relationship of the indigenous people to, you know, what the white man has done and, and, you know, all this stuff over time and, because there, there's a lot of that, but it's just, it's so, and it's not all heavy. It's, it's got some dumb shit as well, but it's funny 
and it's smart and it, yeah, it's just so well done. And I'm so happy to finally see Native American representation done by, you know, actual indigenous people. Yeah. You know, and I've gotten into these discussions with my mother and got, like I said, I gotten her, I've gotten her into it and she grew up on the uh, desert of California, uh, lived near like where they filmed all those old westerns. Even went to high school, like school with one of the Roy, one of Roy Rogers' sons. Um, you know, and met Roy Rogers and Dale Evans many a time when I'd go out there and visit, you know, my grandparents and stuff. But, you know, she grew up going to those Westerns where it was cowboys and Indians and the racist kind of, you know, view of it. And she loved those movies, you know, but she recognized they probably weren't, you know, 100% historically accurate or anything. But she's loving to see this because she said, yeah, there were Native Americans or, you know, where I grew up as well, you know, and they weren't, it wasn't, you didn't see them in their lives necessarily as it was in, uh, reflected in media. So, you know, she's kind of like it. You're right. It is nice to just see, like, also, they don't have to be, you know, it's just breaking this stereotype of always, oh, the Native American is the noble, you know, person with all this wisdom and blah, 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 and all these other stereotypes. And it, it celebrates the culture as well as just showing, no, they're just ordinary people. <laughs> like, you know, and it... Um, yeah, but I, 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 yeah, I recommend it a lot. It's, there's a lot there. It's very multi -blicked. And like I said, it's smart and just funny as hell at the same time. Like, and it, and it does still have those stupid moments <laughs> where they're just making fart jokes. I mean, it, it really, cause they're teenagers, right? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. It would be inauthentic if it was absent. Right. It, you feel that these are everybody, even the people in the background that are just passing through. Everybody is very three-dimensional. And every article I've read, you know, or interview I've, I've seen with people who work on the show, they're all like, oh, no, I included this because I know a person like this. Or, you know what I mean? Like, and, you know, you've even got... um indigenous hip hop in there there's a whole like video in for greasy greasy fi fry bread <laughs> yeah and apparently it has become like a hit in like native american hip hop it has like its own scene like a whole legit music scene that you don't hear about nice so you get Exposure to that as well. I mean, like, there are things like that that's like, oh, that's awesome. But I will give one last recommendation and then we will, I know, I'm, I'm babbling, but I got really, I'm really excited about that. But um, one last recommendation um, before we move on. Um, oh, what was my recommendation going to be? Apparently... Never mind, because I'm blanking on what it is. <laughs> All right. Well, that's probably a good place to wrap up as any, um, because yeah, like I said, I could probably go on, but I I've been reading a lot of uh, good books and watching some good movies and stuff uh, because I'm also doing this. I think I've mentioned it before, but this uh, diverse my company in the wake of like last year's protests and everything started a diversity, equity, and inclusion 
uh, committee, which I'm on, and I decided uh, to be on that. And I'm on the um, the kind of book and movie club. In fact, I'm leading that because I'm bananas. Um, <laughs> I guess it's because I don't have a second podcast right now. Or, but, you know, we don't, don't always, like on this show, we don't always read. But a lot of times we will read and watch a movie in a month. And I've been doing some good stuff with that. And um, I'm anxious to discuss some of those with you. But I, And I do recognize, recognize that those are perhaps a little bit more politically minded and perhaps better for a Patreon episode, um, a joint Patreon episode between uh, your show and this one. Um, but, you know, I, like, I just, I think, oh, I know what I was going to say, but I decided I'm going to say it next month, so never mind. Um, it fits better with next month's theme. Cool. So, Yes, we're going to move on anyway. But yeah, so like I said, I have, I've been reading and watching a lot there that are just amazing things that we were talking about some before we started recording. So, but that's not what we're here to discuss today. We are wrapping up the first season of The Boys. Um, it's episodes seven and eight. And, um, Darren, I, I think I have five pages to go in this five pages, just five pages in this first comic. And I just put it down, I think, because I got interrupted and then I forgot all of a sudden I had only five pages to go. But, um, and at this point out of being a completionist i will finish those five pages but i i think that's it for me on reading the comic i think i've everyone's been expecting that yeah i well yeah um now's your time because i i will stop asking you about your experience well i guess when you finish it but uh, no, it's, now's your time no, it's to not gonna, it's not gonna change in <laughs> in five, five pages really it's uh you know you get i really gave you my thoughts last time when okay. we talked about it when i you know read most and i really i i realized once i started reading this oh i only had about i think 30 pages left to go in the um yeah. from last time and so I only read 25 more pages, <laughs> but I just realized I'm like, yeah, my feet, it was, it was just more like, I, I, I think I just kept thinking and mulling over what we discussed before. And I, I was kind of like, yeah, n nothing, my feelings haven't really changed. And then it wasn't like, oh, I'm not giving it. It's not, it wasn't me saying I'm not giving it a chance, even for those pages I was reading. It was just that nothing much really seemed to happen over those pages. And I think that frustrated me as well. Because I was like, if you can't get 30 pages and you really haven't moved forward in, in this book much, you know then I feel like you should have at least moved forward more. I feel you. Yeah. Like I said, I and, like, and I, I like the show more than the comic. And that was a pacing issue for me. And I was kind of like, that doesn't bode well either because then am I, if I'm going to read another book, is it going to be a combination of the content starts annoying me and then the pacing as well? I was like, no, that's not going to be worth my time. So, but I should have finished those last five pages, but yeah. But you just hated and I, that much. <laughs> and no, I, no, like I said, I legit got interrupted and then I forgot that it was only five pages I had left to go. I will actually finish them to say I have read them 
add them to my list of, you know, my for my reading challenge of the year. But because um, I think I'm probably one book behind at this point. I don't know. Lance and I are keeping up uh, <laughs> with each other. He's catching up. He, I think he's exceeded me at this point, but uh, I'm not going to quote that. Um, so, yeah. But without further ado, on our last episode, or at least our last episode of The Boys, the boys found the compound V and that was disguised as polio vaccines, making super babies. Dun, dun, dun. Ashley was fired. And they tried to silence, Vought tried to silence Starlight with the sexual assault. And she says, fuck you all. Yay for Starlight. <laughs> Citizen Starlight coming this fall. Right, right. This is when I actually was like, good for you, Starlight. Um, and then the Deep gets exiled to Sandusky, Ohio. Ooh. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Did I miss anything from last episode? I think that's it. Uh, let's see, that's pretty much it. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. Yeah, the Deep has to publicly apologize, yet the public apology is written for him and comes out before he actually delivers it on air. That was the point that I remembered that we were, we all three of us were kind of like, yeah, that, those fucking, those fuckers at Voight. <laughs> well, we'll find out later in the series, but they come from a I mean, long line of propagandists. Well, right. I mean... And fuckers at Voight, you can say that about them for so many reasons. So now, here we are. Darren, bring us into episode eight, The Self-Preservation Society. Or episode seven, The Self-Preservation Society. Is it seven? I believe so. I thought it was eight. Well, let's look. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, wait a minute. No, I think you're right. Sorry, I miscounted. Ah, Yes, episode seven, The Self-Preservation Society, which is the title of comic books number 31 through 34. We start like a good uh, setup before the final episode with a flashback eight years ago from the present, and it's the Vought Christmas Party. There's Black Noir playing... Music that I recognized but couldn't tell you who it was. Um, I was sitting there and I was trying to think who it was. I want to say it was Chopin it's or Haydn. Yeah. But I could be incorrect. You would think with all the piano I took, I'd remember. But I got more into playing um, like jazz and blues on piano. Ah. Uh. Than, ultimate, yeah. than ultimately classical. It's more fun for me to play. <laughs> I could get more into it. I could get more into it. Plus, it was the early 80s, and my teacher actually let me play some like modern stuff, so I got to learn Duran Duran for piano. Because <laughs> it's good keyboard shit. Right. But that's not what by. Black Noir was playing. No. He was playing some beautif beautifully playing, I might add, some classical music. Yeah. Uh, Translucent, of course, is walking around invisible in the Santa costume. Yeah. Uh, and deep. everybody rolling their eyes at him, which I was like, nice touch. Because he looked like the biggest, I mean, like, it was the biggest douchey kind of thing. You're like, uh. Right. It's like he probably does this every year and everyone's just like, you are just such an annoying fuck. <laughs> smile <laughs> i'm at a corporate event sorry yeah no no uh you've been to more corporate events than i have uh deep is i think deep says i love you to Stillwell while she's talking to him about business she doesn't hear him well yeah but do you notice the when they're like she's kind of like like trying to get him like pose with him and she's like closer or whatever and then he does like 
duck lips when he's posing. <laughs> I'm just like, oh. and he like, he just like a whole Kim Kardashian kind of like the way he cocks his body. Like he's sticking at boobs and ass. And I'm like, that is the funniest fucking thing. Cause you, that's something typically female celebrities, like, you know, are seen doing. It is kind of funny. But in a way, it was like he was the trophy on the power individual's arm. Like, yeah. just like a lot of times, it's the man you see in power and it's the trophy wife or girlfriend and who looks whatever. And the that dynamic was kind of there shifted there. It was subtle, but it was like, that was interesting. I mean, we all know still well in the whatever power play she all she has anyway um and brings sec in you know motivate or well manipulates rather uh motivates and manipulates the some of these soups using her sexuality which we'll get to that more this ep later this episode Oh, right. That was the I couldn't remember if it was near the end of this one or the beginning of the next one. But obviously, this season is all, you know, you've been seeing it anyway with the way that she's been teasing Homelander, like over the breastfeeding thing, like in his, you know, lactation, um, you know fetish because of his you know edible complex <laughs> yeah homelander I mean, really got it, a lot I mean, of issues I'm, I'm not a Freudian person but that is really what it comes down to with him in this case it, it and it is explored and expanded upon over the next season i feel like and right. he speaking of homelander he comes walking up on eight years ago, not half dead inside Billy and his previously mentioned Mrs. Becca. Right. Uh, she works for Vaught. Homelander talks about what, you know, thanks her for running his AMA or whatever, his Twitter his takeover. Twitter. Yeah, because she works in marketing. And, you know, let's get together. Let's talk about you taking over my my whole sh all, whole thing. All of his social media, yeah. And, you know, Butcher gets his ribs in. And the show's Billy when he was happy. Right. But he was always still kind of had a little salty. Yeah. I, I, I think it's... I mean, you get the feeling like there's certain things that just all, he was always a little salty about. Yeah, uh, they delve into that also, I think. Well, uh, of course, they expand on some of the characters a lot more in the comic, but some of these stories right. aren't the same. But also between season one and season two, they had a little five to ten minute short that mm -hmm. sort of bridges season one and season two. And it goes a bit okay. more into Billy's past. I will have to watch that because I don't think I watch like any of those trailers or extras or anything. Yeah, there's that that's in there. And I, there's it's... one full of outtakes. Speaking of Homelander, where he can't stop oh, okay. laughing when he's drinking milk. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's um totally derail. Is season three out yet? No. Not yet. Okay, I didn't think so. I didn't think so. Okay. I think they've finished shooting it, but they okay. haven't really said I, when it's gonna be. I out. thought I thought it was done. I it was done, but I was uh, yeah, I, I heard it was done, but I thought it had been released, so Okay, gotcha. Yeah, they they wrapped production very recently. I think there were reports okay. about uh, production wrapping last week. Ah, okay. 
and I don't think they've said when it's going to be out. They, <laughs> I think it was them, you know, Vought has its own Twitter and Instagram. And I think they said every, every time, every time they get asked when it's going to come out, they're going to delay it a week. Dicks. I think that that's what they funny. said. That is kind of funny, though. <laughs> um, it quickly transitions from Billy and Becca talking about going back to their house and being on their A game to right. uh, Annie and Huey in a hotel. Butcher watching them go into said hotel from afar, running some surveillance. Keep tabs. Tailing get, get his angry. boy Huey. Yeah. Uh, hey, Zora. And, Zora's so hot. Uh, there's what they, they talk. They're, they're getting a little bit more serious about their relationship. I can't remember. Is this when her eyes light up? Yeah. Uh, which sort of reminds us of episode six when they go to the uh, uh, re- victims of soups or whatever support group. Yeah. Obviously, Annie is in the moment and yeah. like people are. You know, they have the cute moments about, I just want to make sure that all this shit isn't a red flag. Right. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, yeah. what, the, hotel, the hotel's a fun thing, not a red flag thing. Um, he's like, yeah, I just, I don't have a job and I live with my dad. <laughs> Which is true, okay? He's just leaving some things out, and I'm, but I'm not saying it's, he, yeah, he should be more truthful before she finds out the way she does. Right. That would be all I have to say to that. As with many things, if people were more upfront, half the movie and half the show wouldn't have to happen. Right. Is this when uh, Everybody Hurts comes on and there's Deep in his apartment in Sandusky? Okay. So... Like I like I said in the intro from the previous episode, the recap, the Deep has been exiled to Sandusky, Ohio, for his repeated sexual assaults and um, just general boringness and bad behavior. <laughs> um, but yeah, boringness, I think. I mean, they they realize he's not as valuable of to these superhero crime fighting squad. Like mm-hmm. a lot of people give that criticism to Aquaman. Okay, Boy, which, he which he's fish. obviously mocking as a character. Right. Of course. Of course. Of course. We know that, and that's why I brought it up. That I do know of comics. Um, you know. Every makes everybody's like that's all he can do. Well, <laughs> you know, but as if that's like there are other superheroes who can only do one thing. You know, they that's why they all work together as a group, right? But whatever, Vot. Uh, He's not worth anyway. the downside right now. He, well, but look at all the downside and all the baggage that comes with his shit. Um. I'm sorry, even the fish, you know, and other sea creatures don't want him. Yeah. So, so my only other cinematic reference to Sandusky, Ohio, is Tommy Boy. (laughs) Oh, right. (laughs) And I know from living the reputation of Sandusky, from living in, in Cincinnati, um, and having driven around Ohio, like it's not just good for whatever, but it, it's kind of funny that like Tommy Boy and then this, this is the other place that they kind of pull out of like, oh yeah, it's Sandusky. <laughs> like, and it just seems like, oh, it's such an armpit of a place compared to, oh, you were in New York. <laughs> you know what I mean? 
which New York's not even for everybody. I get that. I love it here, but not every, it's not for everybody. I totally understand that, right? But Deep is also accustomed but to that. Deep. It's like, That's what, just, I have to make my own food? He gets a per diem of $75 a day for food. He has to make his own food, and there's a Dairy Queen. And he's like, what? I can get a blizzard? <laughs> I love that he gets excited about that. But then he's like, oh, fuck. And then he, the sad reality, you know what I mean? Yep, um, there's not really a lot of crime around here, so just hang out in this dank apartment. It's not bad, but it's not good. It's, it's no, like one of no. those by the week hotel places. Or the, yeah, exactly. That you can also rent by the month. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, but you're right. When he's been accustomed to living in New York and in that big fancy tower at Vought where they had people cooking and cleaning for them. You know, he had a stylist, you know, all this stuff. He had a, you know, PR team there, you know, in, an assistant whenever he needed, you know, if he needed something. You know, he had all those kinds of things there at the drop of a hat. He doesn't have any of that. This guy, this schmo that's here to give him this introduction and checks in with him at another point is really such a low man on the totem pole in the, in the big vault scheme of things that it's kind of like, what difference is he going to make? Not much. He's limited, but the, but deep doesn't get that. This is his own doing. He doesn't and, really seem to get that. And he doesn't seem to think that it's going to last long. Exactly. As I guess a lot of people who are used to getting away with all kinds of shit think. It's like, well, you know, it's going to be a blowover and everything will go back to being perfect for me because largely my life has been inconsequential. Well, and so then, and I'm maybe skipping around a little on this episode, but Sorry. while we're st while we're still on the topic of the deep, you see that he goes and picks up some girl and brings her back, or woman, brings her back here, and they're going to have sex. And whatever, and she ends up sexually assaulting him. <laughs> yeah. Uh, with his, that was this episode, his, his gills. His gills. And while sexual assault I is never, I never, I don't approve of it. In this case, it, it was a little bit of karma. It was it was a fucked up karma. And I you think know? that was part of uh, the woman's intent. Doesn't she say and something maybe, about that? No, she doesn't. She doesn't. She's in. She thinks it's just gonna be fucking hot, and that's how you would fuck someone who has guilt. She, like, and she's not thinking of it. She doesn't, she's, she doesn't say anything like referencing, like you think someone else, you think you can take advantage of someone else without their consent. She doesn't do any of that. She's just trying to get her rocks off. Because she's, yeah masturbating while she's doing it. She's not just, you know, it's not just the violence, it's sexualized violence. Right. I mean, not rape though, even when a cis male penetrates a female, like that's not just like, I'm not saying penetration. Well, I'm trying to think how to, the it, that kind of rape is not necessarily about sex either. You know what I mean? That's True. not necessarily about sexual thrill. That's about domination. You know what I mean? 
So she attacked him but, in a similar way to how he attacked other people. But there are certain people, I will say, like the crime, though, of sexual assault, rape, is a crime of domination, first and foremost. You do not have to necessarily be sexually motivated, but there are some people who do get actual sexual gratification out of it. You know what I mean? And I think in this instance, with her, sexual gratification was part of it, part of the goal for her. Not just the domination over him. And being with, she was fetishizing him also. Yeah, she like just sexual. hoped that he was into it, and he wasn't. She didn't care, in a way. But at the beginning, like got, I think she... She was hoping, at the. I think she was initially hoping he'd be into it. But he said no multiple times. Right, and, and then stop. she was like, no, just enjoy it. Like, sit back. Like, and... Like I said, it's fucked up. But... It, Seems it a natural is, aspect it, of his character arc, or a, right. a natural event in his character arc. It, it does, it, absolutely. Absolutely. And now, in the comic, since we are, you and I are not going to discuss it <laughs> any further on here, is there any retribution for, does Starlight speak out about like really about the her sexual assault i know it wasn't a, with the deep in the comic but does she speak out about that publicly in the comic she does uh she does talk about it i'm trying to remember exactly how i don't want to give misinformation but she does say something and is there any retribution it's more internal okay um she kicks somebody's ass. Okay. And uh, another attempted assault happens. And uh -huh. she defends herself. And, like, uh, I believe it's Homelander is like, you get what you fucking deserve, dude. Uh, to the person. Yeah. Uh, it's It's not as good as it is in the show. I know. I'm just curious because you know, and and when did the comic first come out? Oh man, that was early thousands. I think it was the 2001, maybe. Yeah. See, again, you're writing in it about the, for the show. You're putting this out in a lens, a post kind of me to kind of more environment you know this first yeah. season came out in 2019 and the first episode of the comic was 2006 right so that changes the conversation a little bit you know i think that it explains why they had to really address starlight's sexual assault by at least and make it at least one member of the seven that's there who does it to her you know even if it's not multiple ones and they needed to have her get some sort of with it they cut out for a second we said get some sort of blank with it oh okay um, no, I was just saying, get some sort of uh, actual, real, genuine reckoning. Mm. Yeah. You know, and some sort of legitimate resolution. Nobody gets Not in trouble just... with corporate in the comic, if that's what you mean. Yeah, that, that's what I mean. Like, not even... One thing to even say a, something small and internal, but to have something happen on a much larger scale and publicly... And corporate to also deal with it, that's something that 
is definitely seen through comes from a more modern lens of this storyline and I think why they had to change it. Yeah. I appreciate it because you couldn't have ignored it if you had done it the way that the comic did. Oh, right. At least what I saw. Even if it were just only one of them, not multiple, I feel you would have to have it genuinely dealt with. Even even with their level of fame and untouchableness. Or untouchability. Right. That's probably a better way. Right. <laughs> and so to go back to the deep and his fucked up karma, like I said, he did do this to himself, but I'm not saying this was necessarily the way to handle it. I'm not crying, however. <laughs> <laughs> you feel less sorry, bad not, about it. Yeah. Sorry, not sorry. Um, yeah. <laughs> kind of. Hey, you know, I, I think it's a little bit cathartic for the it, viewer. Even yeah. in the like, okay, this isn't cool. Okay, well, this this happened. Well, if it's going to happen to anybody. Might as well be the rapist. It, right, it's there's it, right, um, but chronologically, from... okay. But then you well, to go back, but did but then this is goes to where you were saying everybody hurts the R, the REM bit. That's what then we see this, then we see something else, and it happens in the episode. But to keep on with kind of connected with the deep is we see. The, um, after that, we see the the deep talking to his Vought, you know, contact in Sandusky a little later. And here's the deep thinking, like, he's just, you know, been violated and he's in a fucked up place because of that on top of just being in exile. And then he's like, oh, thinks this guy is coming to him. Like he's going to like see, hey, is there something great for me to do? And then it's like he gets the news of just basically, no, just sit, you know, sit, sit tight, tight, just stay here. Go, uh, like, go to the grocery store. Just go to the grocery store. Like, yeah, I mean, like, kind of like without saying it, but saying, no, you're staying right here, dude. You know? Um, and then we see the deep with the Arium, everybody hurts. Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that that's basically the story of Deep in this in this episode. Yeah, and 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 just the, and he does like the kind of crazy, not even like good shaving job on his head so that there's some, still some little like tufts of hair and things sticking up here and there. And then he just looks at himself in the mirror and like, does he start to cry or just do tears look, does he look like he's going to start to cry? I think it looks like he's going to start to cry. Uh, it yeah. says something like you can't stop now or okay, well, whatever. Yeah. And in a way you're just kind of like, uh, how the mighty have fallen and he's just you do in a way feel kind of bad for him but it's his own undoing as well yeah but it, i guess this is the transition where he starts being if at all more of a sympathetic character right and i think just like we start to see with some of the other suits where they're starting to doubt, they you see they start at different points to doubt, except for Homelander, of course, um, because he thinks he is God and invincible. But um, you, you've started to see Maeve already in this place of she's disillusioned, but she's still kind on board, you know, she recognizes she's in a fucked up tough spot. And she, 
and she's just kind of like, Zora, that's really annoying. Um, that, you know, that she just, she has one day where she doesn't know where she is. And then other days she's like very confident of, no, this is my role and, and that kind of thing. So, um, which we see more of that, I think in this episode, because it's exposed in this episode, like Homelander figures out that, okay, who's after them and that it's because of Huey and that he and Starlight have a relationship going and he exposes her to the seven at the staff meeting yeah no not complaints. you black noir black. you've been great you know yeah i know i thank you are we sharing a brain today <laughs> <laughs> not you i have no complaints about you black noir you're doing great um like he does the finger point too yeah he does that politician kind of finger point oh <laughs> you know what i mean like that also you just see so many like propaganda leaders do too uh, which good and he's, bad. he's probably working on in this episode because also sort of a side story that doesn't get addressed that much in this episode but in the background still well is still working on getting the votes for the soups in the military bill that they've been working well, on this season they mention it in is it this episode or the next one? I think I they think show her they on the phone for a second saying, like, thank you, Senator. Yes. It's the next one where something comes up when with Jennifer Esposito. Rainer? Um, yeah. That is she gets shown the video of Nakib at the end of this episode. Terrible. Yeah. 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 So they, you see, you do find out, they do mention it a little bit in this episode and the next. Not a lot that this whole vote thing is still, you know, up in the air. Yeah. The thing Homelander um, was pushing after the flight crash, which I'll have to tell you since you're never going to read the comic, the slight differences in, in that yeah. or send you some screenshots. Just so mm -hmm. you can check that scene out. But that's why the Brooklyn Bridge is gone in the comic book. Ah. And it takes place on 9-11. His fucking fault? Who, Homelander? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's yeah, all I, this. I, it's, it's more of the seven. It's like a plane, and yeah. it's just a big clusterfuck. Um Yeah, I'll, I'll send you some screenshots so you can check it out. It's, uh, it's not very long. It would, I, I, it would figure it would be him. <laughs> Destroy that bridge I love so much. <laughs> That's part of my commute that I miss going, miss every day. Like I've been missing during quarantine. I mean, working from home is is nice. I do get a little to sleep in a little bit more, and I don't have to, you know, spend as much time commuting all, all the time commuting. But I, there's part of my commute where my train would take me across the Manhattan bridge and I would look over to the Brooklyn bridge. And if the weather was right, I can also see the statue of Liberty in the distance behind the Brooklyn bridge. Yeah. It's just one of those things. Cause it's, it's just, yeah, it's just, I like, I love the architecture of it. It's a beautiful bridge. Makes makes a really pretty makes and the, it just makes a really pretty view. Anyway, side note. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking Homelander. Yeah, him at his little meeting, you know, tisk tisk everybody except Black Noir. But yeah, I, and, and like I said, you he exposes Starlight and in the relationship with Huey. And then A Train, and then he like shows A Train that Huey met uh, 
Huey met A Train, like it was Robin that he killed, Huey's uh, late girlfriend. And, um, but of course, the way that Homelander is playing out this whole story for the Seven and for Starlight, we know it didn't happen this way, but because when we know that when Huey met Annie, aka Starlight, he didn't know she was Starlight. And he had met her before he got involved with Butcher and the boys. You know what I mean? Like, it was a time where he was genuinely upset, grieving over Robin. And so it was like, I guess maybe Huey was just meeting the boys at that time, but he hadn't really signed on yet. Yeah, they now, will. That whole scene that, was them both trying to, sorry. Make to a decision. Over. Yeah. No, 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 you're right. You're right. Thank you. It was them trying to make a decision. But they they met in, in a totally different kind of thing. And that's not, you know, of course, Homelander, whether he does it on purpose or not, he may not know how they actually met. He probably, he wouldn't care anyway, truthfully, even if he did know. Right. He's that kind of person. He's going to try to make himself look like, you know, he's going to make Huey such the bad guy regardless. And he could lie in whatever way possible just to try to get rid of Butcher and the boys. Yeah, he's a sociopath. He's a sociopath. And he sees... He also sees Huey as just, like, the weakest link and, like, the least of their problems. He just sees Huey as the one who's... He just is like, no, I'm going to... The narrative I'm going to use is that he's been getting... Purposely getting closer to Starlight to get information for the... You know, so that we can be destroyed or whatever. The seven Which, is down to five. Yeah. But... Half that was the Deep's fucking own fault, but of course Homelander would still well, blame Annie. Of course. Well, and he it is a subtle, in a way, he's setting it up like it's all because, yeah, he just, he sets it all to this, we're gonna, it's all her, it's all her, it's all her. She's the problem, she's the problem. And not like, and like they're all perfect, even though he knows about A Train's, you know, addiction, and he knows, you know, where Maeve stands, and how she's disillusioned as well, and he, and how she's realizing, this is we're not doing good anymore, or very rarely are we actually doing good. And if we are, most of the time, it's set up as a PR thing. And so Maeve, we see, stand up for Annie, or Starlight here. And Maeve says, I will take care of this. She And, like, and says, she truly didn't know. Listen to her. She didn't fucking know. Like, basically saying Annie is too stupid. Like, that's her fault. That's the fault. And maybe, and... Because Homelander would believe that easier than... Right. ...the other. And I think to some degree, Maeve believes that. But I think Maeve also, she recognizes just... Because she's had a relationship torn apart because of being a member of the Seven. And At least one. That. At least one, but we see one very significant one, which we see more of in the second season. Yes. Spoiler. <laughs> if you haven't watched the second season yet, um, if you're just following along with us. But um, we see that and we find out more about, you know, her. And, but we're also starting to see like A-Train crack 
because he's trying to get off the V, the compound V. <laughs> v, <laughs> like this is true blood here. No, it, um, but uh, compound V. And he's trying to train, you see him, I think it starts in this episode, him training again with his brother and he realizes how much he's slowed down because he's not on the compound V like to give him that push and his brother's like calls him out. Like, I know you've been basically juicing essentially. Um, you know, look at what the doctors are saying. This is what this is going to do to your heart. Yeah. And all this stuff. And this is, you know, terrible for you. And all these things they say about steroids, um, for athletes that do that kind of thing uh, for extended periods of time. And, and then also uh, what they will also say about people who are under the influence of certain uh, illegal drugs as well. And um, so, yeah, we get that kind of glimpse where he's kind of like, wants to kind of like destroy Huey and the boys because he he's blaming even though he killed Popclaw he's blaming them for like it's their fault I had to do it you put her in danger and then you threw her away well no, no i guess he's talking to himself yeah he's the one that did that how does this not all come back to you huey even though the, the series started with him running through robin and so i uh, same as the right. book i mean right that's one commonality they have is they start with a train killing robin right right where are we with is that take us through everything in this episode? Well, the end at the end, Annie and Huey meet in the park, and Butcher oh. shoots her. Oh, I was thinking that that was the beginning of the next episode. Yeah, that's the very end. They do and... meet again in the park, but that's the very end of episode seven. Is the park and okay? She's like, I'm gonna arrest you. And yeah. Butcher shoots her, and they run off. But the, yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much the end. But not before he tells her about Compound V and how Vought has been making suits, and that Annie basically was made a soup. All soups were made by Vought, he says. And that's where that episode ends. The, the penultimate episode of the season. So do we need to take a, sorry, do we need to take a break before we get into the next episode? Uh, it's up to you. I figured we either take a break before we do the next episode or we take a break at the end of this before the next one. I don't think we need to do both. No. Let's take a quick break now. And then we will be back to finish out the episode. This is Michael Caine, award-winning film actor you may know from such cinematic achievements as A Muppet's Christmas Carol and Jaws for The Revenge, where I played a character named after a fucking sandwich. I approve of the following promotional message. Do you like movies? Well, of course you do, you silly twit. You're listening to a movie podcast right now. Do you like podcasts about movies? I mean, if you're listening to this, your life is empty and without direction. So of course you do. Why not continue the spiral downwards with... They must be destroyed on sight! Yet another semi-regular podcast about film that will occupy some of that empty space in your soul. We cover every genre, but focus on a lot of obscure and cult films with a leaning towards exploitation. If you want 
a podcast that's going to talk about a silent film from the 1920s one week and a sleazy biker film from the 1960s the next, and then back to something like Singing in the Rain the next episode. They must be destroyed on sight. Maybe for you. So tune in and join regular hosts Lee Russell, Daniel Hopper, Paul Romali, and Lee Hardy, as well as the odd guest host at tmbdos.podbean.com Thank you, drive through. We are back with uh, the final episode of season one of The Boys entitled You Found Me. Okay, season finale time. Take us away, Darren. All right, let's see. The You Found Me was the title of issue number 72 of the comic. And it kicks off with the U.S. troops in another country. I know, surprising. Well, you didn't we we saw a, a tail end of this at the beginning at we saw a bit of this at the tail end of last episode though. Right. I was making a joke about American soldiers being in other countries. But um, you are correct. Yes. I did not address that and I'm sorry I interrupted. Go it's, ahead. It is all right. Uh so they are in Syria where they we had seen the previous footage of Nakib which they say is captain, or uh, means captain. Uh, so there's U.S. soldiers, and then Homelander shows up. There's like doing the politician talk. You know, you guys mm-hmm. are the real heroes. And then he just goes in and kills everybody in the... It's a Compound V factory, right? It looks like it's opium. I mean, or heroin. Okay. Well, same it's difference. A, some sort of drugs. Some sort of drugs that aren't compound V. But he comes out. No, no, no. It, no, it's it's powder. Okay. It's powder. But he, but he comes looks, out it, with it, compound V. But I think that maybe that's in part of it. Right. Or it's just framing it like, oh, look, we found these terrorists making compound V is how I took it. They do have it framed initially like, oh, this is a more quote-unquote typical drug lab, um, I- illegal drug lab. Um, and then the compound V is the element that's revealed. Because you don't initially story. see that. You don't initially see that. That's what it is. Does that transition right next to the next thing being uh, Stillwell and Senator, forget what his name is, but Jim Beaver in real life? Or is this when, does it go next to the deep being told he's not coming back? I thought that was in last episode when the deep found that out. Well, he was pretty sure. But in early oh. on in this episode, he's like, okay, okay I'm ready. Then it's, then it's this one, and then this is where he shaves his head. Oh, okay. We got ahead of ourselves. Sorry. But they, I mean, it's it's a whole story. So, uh, as, as can happen when you jump around timelines and different characters. Uh, but yeah, I have, one of the things I have jotted down is Deep isn't invited back. And then right. uh, at another hotel, the boys' hotel gets raided while Butcher and Huey are on their way. Where are they coming from? They're going to talk. No, no, no. They're not going to talk to Rainer. Who are they going? Or uh, the, wait... the original um, Mallory, right? Mallory. They're going to talk to Mallory. Yes. Okay. Butcher's going to go talk to Mallory and, and Huey's going to come with him. So that means uh, Kyoko, Frenchie, and Mother's Milk are there together. Yes. And the whatever team 
the Black Ops team that either mm-hmm. works for Vought Vought's. or works with Vought. Right. Division of. Yeah. Snatches them up. Uh, the female is closest to getting away. Mm-hmm. But she finally succumbs to the gas and they drag her out from underneath the van. Well, no, they had they shot her in the leg when she jumped out the window. And so that was starting to slow her down as she was like crawling underneath the van in the parking lot. Frenchie and Mother's Milk succumb to the gas. She sees the two of them getting put into a van and for a moment she thinks she has a chance and then she conks out and then someone drags her out. And Butcher notices that something has happened when they're driving by. Because he sees a survey, a, a Black Ops type fake surveillance van. And Mark so something flowers. about the window. I, yeah. I love that. Full of guys getting ready to come out and grab us. And the window's new, I think he says. And a couple things that, you know. Former secret agent type Billy would notice yeah. that, you know, Huey obviously doesn't notice at all. And uh, this one's a bit more of an action packed episode. It seems like the last one, there's a lot of plot and this one is a lot of action. Well, this is a season finale. I think it's to be expected. Yeah. Um, at least I, well, I expected it um, because you need some sort of, resolution to get you at this point before you you know move on to developments or whatever to some new aspects of story in season two right so you you expect to see some loose ends tied up and um while you're still expanding on the universe and this story but um we need to talk about Mallory because there've been all these references leading up to this, um, between like with Mallory uh, about Mallory and Mallory's family, um, with butcher mother's milk and Frenchie talking about whatever past missions that they did that just went awry. Whatever one that they did that went awry. And we here we find what it was her grandchildren? Yeah. That were, were all killed. Um yeah. So that's specifically what happened and she's kind of like I don't know, I'm taking a I'd be taking a huge risk to depend on you after what happened you know and that's true because it's kind of she's she's got the point of how how are things going to be different this time yeah and grace mallory was greg mallory in the comic yeah of course uh but similar uh fate to the grandchildren Mm -hmm. but I feel like that was uh, they had I think they had photographs of Homelander doing some season uh, season two Homelander type stuff I think that's how that went yeah um so yeah, they they go to see Mallory. And what she said something about now you actually need to keep that promise of never coming back to my house again. You um, know what I just thought of? What's that? We alluded to it, but we never discussed it. Or is it this episode where it happens? With oh, it's this episode. I'm, we alluded to it last episode, but it was this episode where it actually happened. Um, so we we realized that, I mean, Huey and uh, 
what is it, butcher. When, when do they decide that their families are in danger? Oh, they get the I'm and burned to, was in yeah. the last episode. That was in the last episode. Yeah. But the uh, the resolution to that is in this episode. Oh, OK. So we see where a train has gone. Thank you. That's why they went to Mallory. Okay, I was getting yep. it out of order. Yeah, A Train um, went to Huey's house, and is sitting there with Huey's father. Yeah, the female fucks him up. That's why. And he, then, yeah. right, and then what happens there? Because we're starting to see the downfall, more of the downfall of A Train. Fucking breaks his <laughs> leg. Yeah, with a pipe or something. I don't know like, what. Yeah, like, or with something. Oh, my God. It does a number on it. And, yeah. So, um, the female and Huey get Huey's father out of there. And that means they got to get a mother's milk um, family safe. Yep. And Frenchie's girlfriend takes off. <laughs> right. I think she's the Which, one that lets them know that they're on. Yeah. 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 But that also seems to be like, okay, this is part of the profession she had chosen to. Mm -hmm. Like, if this happens, it has to happen. Yeah. Monique, uh, Mother's Milk's wife, takes it a little yeah. differently. Well, of course, because she already did not want him to get involved with Butcher again. And he said he wasn't. <laughs> yeah. He lied. Or that, or this is different. No. You know. Right. You always say it's different. You always say it's different. Uh, but, but at this point, we see the... Um, corporate event right with the uh, for Vaught, where Stillwell finds about her promotion yes from Giancarlo Esposito yes whatever his name is in this show Mr. Edgar Edgar yes and moving up to that 82nd floor right so, um, and then she's, and basically she's, Homelander tells her, because they're still trying to pump up this, um, you know, getting soups in the military thing. Yeah. They, uh, Homelander lets her know, basically, that he was the one who created this super terrorist as <laughs> propaganda. And then she ends up really making him happy in her office. Um, like I said, whatever relationship, fucked up relationship they've had. Um, yeah. Psychosexual power play kind of thing in his Oedipal complex, you know, and I think she also is not only doing it because I feel in a way she is turned on by this. But she's also like, I'm going to sleep with him because I know this is what he's been wanting and I will be able to manipulate him more. Oh, yeah. She I is think a shrewd she also, person. I think she very much has that in her mind. I think she still very much has that in her mind. Yeah, absolutely. And I think maybe, because when I re referenced earlier where she was kind of like using her sexuality with the deep, when we see the flashback like eight years earlier and stuff like that, I don't think that ever got past a, a like, mild flirtatious thing 
because she was like, I don't have time to be bothered with that. It's, he's far beneath me for one, you know, right. yada, yada, yada. But she also just recognizes that he's not as powerful on a chessboard as Homelander is. If I'm going to sleep with any of these soups, I know which one to sleep with. <laughs> she is, it, it is all this big chess game. Uh, so she can gain whatever power. She's smart like that or uh, crafty or shrewd like that. Shrewd. She's a, she's also a diabolical person with a lot of her intentions and the corporate intentions she drives because it's, you know what I mean? It's not just, and she sees it, it's not just her interest. She's a company gal. Yeah, exactly. Homelander still is very much, it, it is very much about himself. But he knows how to fit in the corporate realm. It's just, when's it going to be restrict him too much that it's going to be a problem? And we started to see last episode before this where he goes back to or has it happened yet where he goes back to basically the Vought scientist played by John Dorman um, who helped create, create him in the lab. That happens off and on that episode and this episode. I think oh, okay. this episode is when he says you were my greatest failure. Yeah, that's later in this episode. I know that. But I didn't know if the other, the other one was also this episode or if it was at the end of last episode. Yeah. I watched these two episodes back to back this time. And so they blended together a little bit. That's fine. I mean, we're talking of we could have just talked about the last two episodes in one chunk and it would have been OK. Right. Right. That's true. I know it, we when we talk about movies, we don't necessarily do things chronologically as is anyway. But um, yeah. We are keeping the stories connected. Trying to keep a little bit more connected. Right. Because I think even when you, when we covered Handmaid's Tale, we were kind of doing it a little bit that way as well. Yeah. Um, but again, that's another show that deals with flashbacks. <laughs> so you can, you know, it's you can't, and there's not always just a linear storyline that stays with just one character. So, yeah. Which that's perfectly fine, but. Um, so yeah, Butcher and Huey, well, okay, meanwhile, we see, um, Starlight, she goes to speak to her mother about, was she a compound V baby? Was she made in a lab, basically? Not made in a lab like Homelander, but. Was she made into this? You're born miracle. Right. And her mom talked up the big God Jesus game around it too. Jesus sent a doctor that was part of po Operation Paperclip, possibly. Right. And... <laughs> That's about what it sounds like. They paid for all the medical bills. Your dad didn't so take did all of our money. <laughs> so did MK Ultra. <laughs> right, right. Those shifty German scientists. You know how it goes. Those shifty American scientists. That's true. I guess at that point. And those Well, and also some of those shifty German scientists that we had work with American scientists. Let's not forget that. Yeah. Oh, um, because that is kind of what happened <laughs> in a less conspiratorial sense. 
I'm just pointing that out. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's a discussion for another day, but the Homelander's on the case and he's talking to, uh, Dr. Vogelbaum. I forget I think his, name his name is. I just know the actor. I'm pretty sure it's Vogelbaum in the show. Uh, but anyway, as you were saying, no, and we're and she's just uh, confronting her mother about it, and her mother, like, you know, just like, no, I just like I wanted you to have a better life or whatever, and I wanted you to be able to do all these things, and it's kind of like Starlight's kind of like you didn't think that I could do the best of my ability on my own, and that you thought that was a bad thing, like. You know what I mean? It, this whole kind of realization of, like, you weren't valuing me, like, <laughs> and then, like, it, as if she weren't already thinking this towards her mom, after there was that whole episode that we saw, that delightful episode at the Christian Fest, where she, you know, goes on stage and basically reveals about how she doesn't have her act together and she's been sexually assaulted and everything. Um, it's, and she becomes dis really disillusioned with her. You can see she's becoming very disillusioned with her mother that episode. Um, but then you see it, you really see it here where she, it, she's like calling her mom out on, all of those things, like, no, you pushed me into doing all these different things. I didn't necessarily want to. All the pageants, getting me up at five in the morning. Right, and that's the kind of thing that you can, that speaks, you know, to a general, kind of any child who has had a parent push them into, you know, it doesn't have to be pageants or, you know, that kind of thing, but sports, you know, maybe you are, are an instrument that you didn't like to play. All these different things that your parents dream pushed you to go to a specific college or school and you were just miserable there and it wasn't right for you, pushed you to do certain things as a profession just because that's what they wanted and they didn't give you any say so because they didn't think you could make your own decision in a way. It, you know, that's kind of what it does come across as. And sure, there are societal expectations outside of what your individual parent or parents may want or do to you, you know, put you through, but there are definite societal expectations that depending on where you live or you know, what culture you grow up in, you know, you fitting into a specific demographic are expected to live this, live your life X, Y, and Z way. And and that's what we've seen Starlight kind of grappling with all along this season. And Huey, too. Because even when they have their post-coital moment in the previous episode, and he said, well, actually, I don't have a job right now. I mean, like, after Robin's death, he leaves out the fact of, like, what happened to the store, but... You know, programming remotes didn't see fulfilling. And and that was a realization he did come to. Because he could have just then stayed, not joined the boys, even if the store had been a drawer, you know, had been destroyed or something, right? Mm -hmm. He could have found another place doing the same exact thing with those skills that he acquired. But he just, no, that's... Now, the filling for me. I needed something more. And I think we all go through that to some extent. At some point in our lives. 
you know, hopefully sooner rather than later than you look back on your life and you're close to death and you realize I wasted my entire life and never did anything for myself, like never anything positive for myself. I, not to say that doing things for other people is necessarily a bad thing, but you should be able to make your own decisions. If you want to do what other people want you to do, then go ahead. But if you're not given an option, that's a different story. If you're not allowed to have an, another option, I think that's a problem too. That's my two cents on how to live life. No, because, I mean, it's really, even if things aren't perfect, because life never is, right? It's still, you can at least be in a better place with your fellow human beings. Any thoughts on Starlight and her mom? No, I think you pretty well covered it. What What's next? What do you want to cover next? Uh, let's see. Well, there's... After that... There's Huey and Butcher split, and Huey goes to try to save the boys. Well, he tells Annie that he's going to need her help, and we don't know if she's going to. And... Huey wants right. to go after Frenchie and Mother's Milk and the female. And Butcher's mm -hmm. like, no, they would want us to finish the job. So if I'm not missing anything, it's mostly the the attempted rescue mission, then the rescue of the rescue mission. Well, well, before before that, um, after, I don't know where it is in all of this, but after... Huey and Butcher talk to Mallory um, and check in with the families, you know, whatever. They, oh no, they, um, they go to Rainer, Jennifer Esposito, and they bring the compound V to her. So then Huey and the boys have come back to this is before the three get captured. Right. By Vaught. But we have to say that um, Huey's dad and then Mother's Milk's family, they are safely taken away. Um, uh, Mother's Milk figured him out. He said, I, I bet there was a deal, but you couldn't get Homelander. You need to reconsider yeah. that. And so he, yeah. he he does reconsider. And it's still, like, still no Homelander. It's like, no, but everybody else. Yeah. She seems to find yeah. a loophole there a little bit. Right. Right. Well, that's because also... When does she find out about the super terrorist. Has, does she already know at this point? I think she does. Yeah. I think that's they showed part her of the what... They showed her the footage, like we said, yeah. they show her the footage at, near the end of the last episode. That's and... why she, yeah, and that's why she's still kind of like, yeah, they and... won't let me give you Homelander. Right. When, he, when Butcher finally says, okay, we'll give you the compound V. Give us v. the, yeah, give us the soups. We're going to keep compound V classified because, you know, right. We're the CIA and, uh, yeah. So Butcher's still on his personal mission. Huey trying to save the group with his retainer. Yeah. But like you said, Huey has, he, he's called Starlight. Um, and he keeps leaving voicemails or whatever. She's not picking up. And so he goes to the motel to try to save 
Mother's Milk and um, Frenchie and Kyoko uh, by getting himself captured. <laughs> Whatever crazy plan. And he hopes, I guess, Starlight's going to show up. And he so Frenchie can pick the lock with the wire from his retainer. Yeah, with his retainer. That's what it is. He's got that plan in place. Kind of an ingenious idea. Huey's picking up on things. It's getting better. And he he recognizes at least how resourceful the others are. Um, so, of course, yes, as expected, he gets captured. He But he gets in the... Um, he gets in the... What do you call it? Gets in there. They get his retainer out. They pick the lock and are starting to escape. <laughs> Meow, exactly. When, is it, who shows up first? The people with guns. The people with guns, right. Thanks, that's what I thought. The people with guns show up first, and um, they somehow... Mother's Milk is able to escape to the side and get go get Kyoko because she wasn't locked up where, where they were. Kumiko. Kumiko, sorry. I was just watching something else. <laughs> that, had, <laughs> that name. Um, sorry, I misspoke. And no, it, so, it's fine. I know you like to have correct character well, names. It's so rare well, that if I... I'm going to, if I'm going to say it... I, you know, I should say it correctly. So, anyway, uh, Frenchie and Huey are there, uh, but um, they end up getting rid of the guys with the guns, and then they think they're in the clear, and then suddenly fucking A-Train shows up. Right? Tweaked. Or Starlight shows up first. Uh, Starlight and then A Train, because he's okay. like, "Oh, I should have known." Yeah, that's it. I should have known. And then an awesome superhero fight. Awesome superhero fight, and the best part is they don't actually have to kill A Train. <laughs> he hurt himself. He hurt himself. Um, yeah, uh, it's sad, but it's, yeah, I mean, addiction's never a good thing, but this is just, it's another way that you're, see, like, you're seeing the commentary of this show saying, okay, like, it's karma for another one of these soups, especially after the way he killed Pop Club was an overdose. It wasn't just that he was an addict and he was struggling with his addiction, but that in the midst of his addiction and his craze about that and how it was exposed kind of somewhat, it, you know, he ends up losing it and killing her with this extreme way of it. And so certainly something, again, we see he has done to himself. Which often happens, like, especially with comic book characters and villains. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, they're often part of, if not the entirety of their own downfall with a little help. Well, and the protagonist. And truthfully, and truthfully, the, you know, the bit of karma that happens here. I prefer to see it happen in this way where it's like on its own rather than what happened to the deep. Yes. Because Zora, oh my goodness. Anyone who has ever been around a cat understands. <laughs> Don't worry, Zora, we're almost done. Sorry. Yes, we are. We promise. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, it's just kind of like the deep, like his downfall. And I mean, like it, there were so many things with it, but then we, which just him being exiled to Sandusky would have been one thing. But then the fact that he does get sexually assaulted, that's like an extra bit where you're just kind of like, is it necessary? Not really. But if it's, you know, if it's going to happen, it is for a karmic reason. Because he did the same thing. But it's easier to feel good about what happens to A-Train. Yeah. Precisely. And his, and and A-Train, too. It was even harder because it was someone that he supposedly loved. It was just this other weird kind of thing that this other connection of this isn't doesn't have a level of like stranger kind of thing. There's you know, it's easier to distance yourself a little bit in that way. But when it's you know someone personally and that you know, certain things happen. It's just there there's so many other added components to it. Um, Zora, you get yourself comfortable and stop making a racket. Um but yeah, and so anyway, Starlight, aka Annie, saves the day for them for the moment. Yep. You guys go. I'm going to stay here, use my walkie-talkie. Got a got a 7 down, got a soup down, whatever she says. Yeah. A train is down. Going to try to use her electricity to defibrillate him or whatever. Well, and, and Huey, right, is even, like, trying to save. And so she, at that moment, also sees... I mean, she showed up. So, and he had already explained some things to her. But she's also seeing, by the fact that he's like, we need to try to save him. Like, she's seeing that also... Huey is sincere. It's not like he's, you know, not like there's this big, like he's a big murderer and he's trying to kill everybody. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, it's just. It's a moment you know, for them. It's a moment. Right. For it's, them. it's a moment for them. And the, the death, like, or the, the murder, his initial kill is very much. That in that soup, invisible, whatever, is or translucent. It it very much an accident. Like it was self defense, legitimately. And he didn't want to do it. But again, you've got. But Annie has been in this position where she's been fed so much of this corporate bullshit. And propaganda all her life, starting like from her family, her and you find out her father left her mother, and her, because of this whole thing. Like after a while, he was just like, I can't handle this situation anymore. Knowing this, like I can't handle what happened to my child, and what I allowed to happen to my child. You know, which is sad. But, Speaking of sad, yes, we've got the conclusion of this episode at Stillwell's mm -hmm. house. Yes, finally, Homeland and Butcher have a bit of a showdown, and as Rainer says, "Well, or Mallory, which one says hit him where it hurts?" Stillwell. Oh, Still uh, oh, wait. Who gives the hint? I think it's Mallory. Yeah. I think it's Mallory. M Mallory tells Butcher she doesn't know what kind of relationship they have, but if he's got a weakness, yeah, it's her. It's her. So Mallory gives that hint. And so Butcher decides he's going to use Stillwell as a way to trap Homelander. In the dark inner yes. kitchen. Yes dark in the entire house. 
and Homelander shows how little of a fuck he gives by bringing her baby downstairs towards the bomb. Oh my goodness. As if he, we didn't think he were enough of a dick already. Like, this just really cements it. It's just absolutely cements it. But that whole thing where she's like, take him away. Take him away. And, and he's like, no. Like, don't worry. Why should it's, I? Okay. Yeah. it's okay. Okay. No. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And meanwhile, we find, and so we find out Homelander's been doing some digging in the Vought files. Because he went back. At, well, after. Because initially he went to Dr. Papa Vought, whatever his full name is, <laughs> and talked to him. And then he t- he spoke to Stillwell earlier in the episode about what happened to Becca, like where she disappeared to, Billy's uh, missing wife. What happened to her eight years ago? And Homelander realizes something's not quite right. So he starts asking around and he looks through vault files and here we find out. Dun, dun, dun. Stillwell's been hiding. They've been not telling the full story to Homelander or Butcher for that matter as to what happened to Becca. And since, well, we're fucking spoiling, it's already been out a couple years and we already said we were talking about this, so this is just how this episode and season end. Homelander, before Butcher can blow up the bomb, Homelander uses his laser eyes, laser vision, and shoots out the eyes of Stillwell and kills her. What was your plan again? <laughs> what was your plan? You like you thought I actually really cared about her? Like that would be a mistake on your part. Cuz he is such a sociopath that even what connection he had to Stillwell, I think this might if what Stillwell had told um uh, Homelander hadn't been a lie. I think Homelander would be okay. He would be con- still connected with Stillwell at this point. But since he figures out before this that she lied to him again, you know what I mean? And then as he finds out exactly what is hidden, because we see, because Bo- Butcher then hits the bomb to blow them up. Yet, Homelander manages to save the two of them. He's kind of fast. Because he's kind of fast. And where we end the episode, right? Yeah. Is on a place far away from here where... He walks up to a kid and about seven years old or so. And then out walks Becca. And Butcher figures out that like because of whatever footage that Rainier shows him is that Homelander. Whether consensually or not slept with Becca uh, eight years ago sometime after that holiday party and they have a kid together because Homelander says I'm your dad and then you had to wait forever for season two 
if you were watching it when it was airing. Yeah, I know. Well, and it seems like we've had to wait forever between season two and three, but at least you can understand that just because of COVID productions and stuff. Although they shoot in Montreal. I mean, uh, not Montreal, Vancouver. Mostly. Primarily, yeah. The the I had seen that the Christmas party or the corporate party, mm-hmm. one of the Vought parties, uh, one of those episodes was shot in Ontario. Oh, okay. Yeah, but they're shooting in Canada, and I know Canadian productions were back up and running before a lot of U.S. productions were. Yeah. Uh, and... Because they didn't have the, um, like, they got things under, more under control uh, faster than we did. Well, <laughs> obviously, we're still doing, depending right. on where, but they, where you are in They're the a state. bit safer. It's a bit safer to work in Canada with people right well, now yeah. than it yeah. is to work in the U.S., yeah, but... Um, but that was season one. So I have no idea. Do you have it in you to keep going occasionally and do season two? Or is that going to migrate to just being a psychosemantic show? You know, I'm up for watching more of the series. I am. Um, I've already watched season two... And I'm waiting for season three. So that should at least tell you I've enjoyed it enough to watch it again and discuss it. So that's to be expected in the the future. But in the nearer future, what do you have planned for October? Well, yes, I'm very excited about October. Um, we are, because, you know, we always love spooky time of year um with october and halloween um which you know we do horror other times of year but we we're also kind of uh, since the first half of october um it's still a uh, hispanic heritage month um i wanted to get a uh, some Latinx kind of a mixture of things in this year to give, to give us our theme. We're going to go with um, Latinx uh, ghost stories. So we are going to be watching the devil's backbone and we will be reading, um, which I read earlier this year and I cannot wait to start rereading Mexican Gothic by Silvia Moreno Garcia. And we already have our guest, Iris, um, from Badasses and Boobs and Body Count, um, all lined up. So, yeah. And I know she's already excited about it. So, <laughs> nice. I think we're going to have a good discussion. Awesome. Yeah. And I, yeah, and I haven't seen devil's backbone and forever so i I think this is gonna be yeah nice i haven't Um, seen devil's backbone when did that come out 2001 so i watched it last summer because it was part of duncan's uh, Ah. summer series Mm -hmm. so that was the last time i watched it Right. Um, so awesome. Looking forward to that. But we should probably end this episode. I know. we. I, I Well, because threw in kind of the little recommendation section. I know we're probably a little longer than we expected. But I, want, I, I was thinking about that at the last minute where I was like, you know, we haven't kind of talked about that in a while. And so, yeah, I think it's good. Make sure we at least... Even if we're not doing the full referral slips, we should pop those in every here and there. Got anything else to plug before we say goodbye? 
Not that I can think of at the moment. What about you? Yeah, uh, just plugging along over at Psycho Semantic. And uh, let's see. I, I Like I said, I don't like to talk about episodes before they're recorded. Uh, but as of this recording, so not too far back, maybe one or two episodes back by this point, did Hardcore Logo with our friend Mark from Midnight Horror Show and doing the nasty and stuff. Right. Speaking of our friend Duncan and um, yeah, for, for VD clinic, look up VD clinic pod, uh, VD clinic pod at gmail.com. If you want to write us in the old school way or, you know, Instagram, Twitter, uh, psycho semantic is psycho semantic. One word mm-hmm. uh, and on Twitter. It's at political movies and both are on Legion podcast network. And um, yeah, I think that's that's it for me. Do you want to take us yeah. out, or shall I say goodbye? Just bye, everybody. The cops are coming to get me. Apparently, they're coming. <laughs> they're coming. They're starting early today. <laughs> <laughs> Until next time. Until next time. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. Talk to you later. Bye. That's the sound of the police. That's the sound of the beast.